In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, always and forevermore, for His infinite love, mercy, and kindness, allowing us to be in His holy church, sharing His Word, which is the truth and the life-giving, the one and only, the Word that is written in this holy book called the Holy Bible. Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life, and there is no one else but Him. For those who are with us in this holy church and those who are watching us through live streaming, I pray that you're always in good health and in good spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If I could ask everyone to stand for the Lord's Prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number 119, verses 129 to 144, inclusive. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The entrance of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Look upon me and be merciful to me as your custom is toward those who love your name. Direct my steps by your word, and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. Rivers of water run down from my eyes, because men do not keep your law. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies, which you have commanded, are righteous and very faithful. My zeal has consumed me, because my enemies have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. And all glory be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, always. How are we? Praise that was a very angelic voice. How are we? Great, Great good? Great and good. Wonderful. We thank the Lord. Uh, before we start our um, commentary on the book of Revelation, I'd like to ask our son in Christ, um, Eddie, to start this evening with this hymn.
I surrender. Okay, um, before we start uh, the um, commentary on the book of Revelation, I'd like to make this announcement, and um, proudly so, to make this announcement that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are um, having our first time ever One Jesus International Conference for 2025. We're opening the door for everyone to join in from within Australia and on a global level as well, from all over the world. Uh, and it'll be held here in Sydney uh, by Christ the Good Shepherd Church. And the conference is titled One Jesus International Conference for 2025. It will uh, be for five days from Thursday, the 28th of August to Monday, the 1st of September, 2025. Um, for more information, you can, those who are here in the church, you can uh, see one of the uh, Good Shepherd uh, Youth Group uh, committee member. This, is, this conference is for those who are 18 years of age and over. It includes um, accommodation, and see the pricing on the website, meals, travel to all venues, divine liturgy, spiritual religious lectures, contemplative prayer service, spiritual touring and retreat. So we'll have also a bit of a social sort of uh, connection as well. And uh, for those who are, who are gonna come to Australia for the first time, you'll need to see this beautiful city of Sydney. So we'll be going for a couple of days uh, for a tour and in the love of Christ, and we show you around Sydney as well. Um, 
and maybe somebody lives in Australia has never seen Sydney. So it's a good time and an opportunity to, uh, to do so. There will be educational films and seminars and also volunteering in church ministries and fellowship with us here at Christ the Good Shepherd Church. So this is One Jesus International Conference for 2025. To register, you'll need to visit the official homepage of uh, cgsc.org.au forward slash OJIC, which is One Jesus International Conference, abbreviation OJIC or OJIC. So uh, this is the link C for Charlie, G for George, S for Sam, C for Charlie.org.au forward slash O for Orange or O for One and J for Jesus and I for Igloo and C for Charlie, OJIC. Um, visit, uh, this link will be also available on the church Facebook, Christ the Good Shepherd Church Facebook, Instagram pages. And for you at the church, at the foyer, we have put a, um, a flyer which has the barcode on it. You can use your phone and go to that barcode. It will take you directly to the page where you can register and get to know more information about this um, One Jesus International Conference for 2025. And um, secure payment is also guaranteed when you start making payments towards it. So this conference is open for people that live in Sydney and all states within Australia. So if you're from Melbourne, Queensland, um, Western Australia, South Australia, wherever you're coming from, Tasmania, uh, this is for the people from all over Australia and also from all over the world. Obviously, the number is limited. So um, the sooner you register, um, the more guarantee you'll have a spot in joining us uh, for this One Jesus International Conference for 2025. It will go for five days and it will be, I believe, absolutely wonderful time where um, this beautiful family get together in the love of the Lord Jesus, who is the one who unites us all. Uh, so it'll be wonderful to be together and uh, share the time with the Lord and with, with one another and at the same time also have fun and listen to this good looking bishop and beautiful priest that we have here as well and um, I'm really looking forward to um, this um, international conference One Jesus International Conference so please visit the uh, website look for the link cgsc.org.au forward slash OJIC and uh, you'll see all the information that is needed. And if you need to know more, please see one of the youth group committee members for further information. Um, so that's about the um, conference. It's the first time ever we're holding something uh, as such. And uh, I'm very excited. And I'm sure um, all the priests as well and uh, all the committees that work in this beautiful church are also very excited to have uh, beautiful people from all over the world and from all over Australia as well. So we're looking forward to that. Okay, so now we're going to come to our topic, Book of Revelation, chapter 19. We'll be reading from verses 11 to 16, and I hope we'll be able to finish all these verses. If not, then we'll uh, finish them for next Friday, God willing. But before I do that, almost forgot. Um, I just want to say a very happy Sunday resurrection of the Lord Jesus to every beloved Christian that celebrated the Sunday resurrection, I think it was last Sunday, yes, 31st of March. So happy Sunday resurrection. I don't refer to it as Easter, I refer to it as Sunday resurrection. I believe it's more appropriate because Easter is not a Christian name, it's more of a pagan thing. So that's why I refer to it as Sunday Resurrection instead of Easter. Um, so um, to all be, uh, the beloved Christians, uh, happy Sunday Resurrection. For those who are still fasting, um, our Sunday Resurrection will be on the 5th of May this year. 
there has been a difference of over 30 days this year, but next year will be the same. We'll follow the same date sometime in April, maybe around the 16th of April, I'm not sure, but next year will be the same. We need to pray for at least the Sunday resurrection date to be united uh, with all the Christians um, in this big, beautiful world. Amen. We need to pray for that, my beloved. But at the same time, we are Christians. We need to love one another and um, we need to support one another. And the truth will always be the truth. Therefore, I want you to celebrate Sunday Resurrection, the old calendar, not the new calendar. <laughs> See, the holy fire comes out on the old calendar. And I'll say this to my beloved Orthodox Christians or Christian Orthodox. It is not an Orthodox date. It is the date the Lord Jesus chose where he's showing his divine power that this is the day I rose from the dead, where this divine light comes from his tomb and has been coming from that tomb every single year for the past 2023, going on to 24 very, very soon. Every single year for over 2000 years, this divine light has been appearing in the tomb of the Lord, the empty tomb, I should say, and add. So it's not about Orthodox, it's not about Catholics, it's not about anyone. It's about one person that changed the history of mankind forever. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who lives forever and reigns, rules, conquers forever. Amen. So um, if the Lord chose this day where he's showing his divine light, who am I to say no? Who am I to say no? We need to pray for all Christians to come and unite, at least for Sunday resurrection. It's very sad to celebrate it at different dates. It's not, it's not a very nice image before the whole world. So we pray for the unity. Amen? Beautiful. Now, we come to Revelation chapter 19 and verses 11 to 16 inclusive. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And all glory be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Not sure if we're going to finish all the verses. Just a recap on what we've done thus far. We said last time that chapter 17 and 18 was talking about this great harlot, Babylon the Great, which is the UN slash United States. And then chapter 19 comes and talks about a different woman being the bride to the Lamb of God, who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In chapter 19, we said there are, there is the word hallelujah or alleluia mentioned four times. In chapter 19, the word Alleluia is mentioned four times. Praise Yahweh. The um, first two times where the word Alleluia is being mentioned, that is mentioned by the martyrs of the great tribulation. When you read in chapter 19, you'll see there are three different groups of people being mentioned there as well. There is the martyrs of the great tribulation, 
there is the 24 elders and the four um, uh, the, the four uh, um, creatures the four creatures and then there is the people of the entire world so there is the martyrs of the great tribulation the 24 elders and the four creatures and then the entire people of the world the first two alleluias were actually said by the martyrs of the great tribulation and they said alleluia because of the fall of this great harlot babylon the great in chapter 17 this great harlot fell because of her enemies that surrounded her but in chapter 18 it was her final fall never to get up again and that was the wrath of jesus christ of nazareth upon this great harlot so chapter 17 has one alleluia and chapter 18 another alleluia by the martyrs that came from the great tribulation alleluia because her enemies made her fall and alleluia in chapter 18 because god dealt with her direct directly and judged her once and for all and then there is the other alleluia from the 24 elders and the four creatures being the church of christ both in new and old testament the 24 elders and the four creatures the gospel uh, writers matthew mark luke and john and then the last hallelujah was the voice of god the father where he brings the entire world at the feet of his beloved son jesus christ of nazareth every tongue shall confess that jesus christ is god revealed in the flesh and every knee will bow before him whether they like it or not this is the promise of god the father to the whole world you who have denied my son you who have rejected my son you who have crucified my son i'll make sure that you will confess that he is lord and savior he is god revealed in the flesh and you will kneel before him and worship his mighty name every tongue will confess that jesus christ is the one and only now last time which was two weeks ago we spoke about this woman being the bride to the lamb of god the lord jesus now the angel said to john the beloved he said write this blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb to the marriage supper of the lamb when john the beloved realized that those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb are the entire old testament people and then he himself being the bride of the lamb of god he fell at the feet of the angel out of trembling and joy then the angel said to him whoa do not bow before me you only worship god i'm a fellow servant with you and with your brethren who have the testimonies of, of jesus christ worship god only but it was out of joy said what a glorious moment it is the entire old testament people adam eve abraham isaac jacob all the prophets and the patriarchs of the old testament they're all invitees they've been invited to the wedding and I, John, the weakest of all, I am the bride to the Lamb of God. And what is the wedding all about? The groom and the bride. All those who are invited, they are all focused on the bride and the groom. So John, out of joy, he fell at the feet of the angel, knowing this, hearing this from the angel. And the angel warned him, he said, do not bow before me. You only bow before God because worship is only given to God. Amen. So now, up until verse 10, we came to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
So there are two kind of suppers, two kind of dinners. One is to do with the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the other one is the supper of the great God. Verse 11 comes into and enters into the supper of the great God. And we're going to see what will take place in the supper of this great God. Totally different to the supper of the Lamb. Totally different. Verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. He saw heaven opened. In verse 11 of chapter 19, John the Beloved sees heaven opened. But in chapter 4 of Revelation, John the Beloved sees a door opened in heaven. So in chapter 4 he sees a door opened in heaven. But in 19 verse 11, he sees heaven itself opened, not a door. Because now we're coming towards the judgment, the second coming of the Messiah. No more doors. Heaven will be split in half and opened and every eye will see the glorious King of Kings and Lord of Lords coming to judge the whole world who rejected him in his first coming. So I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Who is this faithful and true? And in righteousness he judges and makes war. None but Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to his holy and mighty name. Now why white horse? And by the way, if you think there are horses in heaven, then you're, you're mistaken. The book of Revelation or the Holy Bible is speaking in our language for us to comprehend and relate to. In heaven, there are no horses, there are no animals. We've said this before so many times and we'll say it again. Now, the only one who can make it to heaven are human beings. Why? Because out of the entire God's creations, the only creation that has a spirit is the human being. Animals have a body and a soul. Does, they do not have a spirit. And the only one that is going back to heaven is the spirit. That's why human beings are the only creation out of all other creations of God that have a spirit in them. Therefore, the only ones who will make it to heaven are the human race. So if you have a pet and you're so attached to that pet, I'm so sorry to break these news to you. You will not have your pet with you in paradise or later on by the grace of the Lord into the Father's house. No animals, no pets, okay? Only human beings. But the Holy Bible is speaking in our language and said, there was a white horse. So there are no horses in heaven. Behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Why white horse? You see, the Lord Jesus here is coming to judge. Because in righteousness, he, he judges and makes war. Why white? The color white represents righteousness. The color white represents fairness. The color white represents peace, no anger. So he's coming to judge. Even in his judgment, he will judge fairly and he will judge calmly. He won't be angry, furious, fuming, trying to abolish everyone who went against him. No, he will judge with absolute peace, calmness, fairness, but sharp like a sword. See, one thing about the Lord Jesus he never loses his control, no matter what happens. Us humans, we do a lot of times. 
We lose our control. We lose our balance. We lose it. We get angry. And when we get angry, everything is a blackout now. I'll say whatever, I'll do whatever, I'll break whatever comes in my way. But the Lord, even when he is angry, he is cool, calm, and collected. You go over there, and you come over here. Thank you. Case closed. So the horse is white to say that he's doing it fairly, he's doing it calmly, He's doing it with control, but he is fair. Now, and he was called faithful and true. Faithful and true. We've said once before, what is the difference between the Lord Jesus and us humans? I'm talking about the Lord as the Son of Man, not the Son of God as the perfect human being. What is the difference between Jesus Christ as the perfect man and every other human being? What is the difference? One thing. In every one of us, there is the yes and there is the no. In Jesus the man, there is the yes and there is the amen. Jesus as the man, the perfect man, in him, the word no does not exist in him there is yes and there is amen in us all humans there is the yes and there is the no that's why we break god's word because of the word no come to church no read the holy bible no fast no pray no smack you no punch you no Rah. The Lord, as the perfect man, when God the Father says to him anything and everything, he says yes and he says amen to everything God asks of him. He always says yes and amen. Faithful, amen. True, yes. With me? So he is called the faithful and true. He is the Amen and He is the yes. the yes, faithful Amen and true yes. Another thing, my beloved, faithful and true, we thank Him for being faithful and true. Why? Because the word true never changes. Truth never changes reality changes we can never relate to ourselves as the truth we can never claim the word truth for ourselves why because we are reality we can never be the truth for one simple reason what is reality everything that is under the time and what is truth everything that is above the time that is the truth so us we are reality why because whatever is under the time is controlled by the time our gathering here in the church is called reality why because time governs my coming and my going there was a time i was at work i was at home i was at a different place the time brought me to the church there is a time and thank god it is the bishop preaching today because it will take a very long time before you go home so there is a time this bible preach session will end this reality will change because time controls us truth is above the time since there is no time nothing changes you see, change comes because of time. As a human being, yesterday I was, today I am, tomorrow I will be. Yesterday I was a baby, today I'm a grown-up man, tomorrow I'm an old man. I changed because of time. The Lord Jesus, 
the Holy Bible says about him the following. Yesterday, he is, not he was. He is, today he is, and forever and evermore, he is the same. Why? Because he is the truth, and we are the reality. When you read in the gospel according to St. John, you will never, you will never ever see the Lord Jesus using the word reality when it comes to him. Why? Because the gospel according to St. John talks about the Lord and introduces him as the true divine God. It is the gospel of divinity of Christ. Since it's talking about the divinity of Christ, the Lord always talks about himself as the truth. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I am the way, the reality, and the life, which he could have very easily said it. He was not short on vocabulary. But the reason why he said the truth, because he's trying to tell us all, I am the only one that never changes. All of you do. Since I am the truth, he is called the faithful and true. True means never changing. Faithful means he sticks to every promise he makes. Why he sticks to every promise he makes? Because he is the truth. He never changes. So whatever promise he makes, he is faithful that it will be done, delivered, stamped, sealed. When the Lord says, I am with you all the days of your life and until the end of all ages, that is faithful. And since he is the truth, that means he will be with us all the days of our lives and until the end of all ages, this is the truth that never change. Whatever I say, I deliver. I am faithful to my word and I am the never changing God that keeps his word. He is called faithful and true. We're not going to finish the verses. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Amazing. Wow. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. At a human level, there is something not correct about this statement, this verse. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. What is not correct at a human level? How can you judge if you haven't made war first? You see, he put judgment before war here. When you want to judge a country, you need to go into war with that country and overcome that country in order to be able to judge that country. True? America, once upon a time, wanted to judge Iraq. To this George Bush Jr., you naughty boy. With all love and respect, you lied through your teeth. But anyway, when America wanted to judge Iraq for having so-called weapons of mass destruction, which was anthrax was given by America to Iraq in the 80s, by the way. The Americans provided Iraq with anthrax. It's a very poisonous substance, a little powder in the air. It can kill a lot of people. Very poisonous. When America wanted to judge Iraq, what did they do? They waged a war against Iraq first. Then they judged the president and the entire nation. True? Now why we need to engage in a war first before we make a judgment? Because as human beings, we cannot guarantee the war we are about to enter, whether we are going to be victorious, triumphant, or we're going to lose the war. We can't guarantee it. It could go either way. But when it comes to God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, He judges, then He makes war. Why? 
because before God engages in any war, he's already won the war. With God, everything is victory. No one can overcome God. That's why he makes the judgment, then he makes war. Because he's already won the battle. When the Lord Jesus came to enter Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, yes, some of us celebrated it, some of us are about to celebrate it this year. When he came to enter Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, what did the Lord Jesus request and ask for? A donkey. The Lord Jesus sat on a mule. You know why? Because my beloveds, the Israelite people lived in Egypt uh, in slavery for 400 years. They learned so many customs of the Egyptians. The donkey, my beloveds, Pharaoh, when he came to engage into a battle, he would sit on a horse. When Pharaoh won that battle, he would sit on a donkey. So when the people of his time saw Pharaoh sitting on a donkey, they knew and understood that the Egyptians, the Pharaohs have won the battle. So sitting on a donkey, a king sitting on a donkey, meaning that the war is won. The Lord Jesus was about to enter Jerusalem. What was going to happen there? It was the last week, which we call the Passion Week. He was entering to engage himself in a battle against Satan and embrace the cross. Before entering the battle, he said on a donkey, the king of all kings. He was saying to all of us, when I come to enter a battle, the outcome is already determined. I am victorious because no one can overcome Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's why when it comes to God, he judges first. Then he enters and makes war. You with me? If you believe in this God, that nothing stands in his way, that nothing shakes him, nothing breaks him, and he is always victorious and triumphant, why are you so worried? Why? Why are you so troubled? Why are you so concerned? Why are you so afraid if you believe this God is always in control and he always wins? Before creating anything and everything, God judges already. God judges. He is victorious. And the one who judge, the one who judges is the one who is in control. The one who is in charge. The one who rules, who reigns, and orders things to happen. God does not need to get engaged in a battle to find out if he's going to win or not. Because it's already predetermined. God always wins. Nothing stands in his way. Trust in this God, his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and let all your worries, all your problems, let him handle it for you. Let him handle it for you. Verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. His eyes were like a flame of fire. If I bring any human being who have a perfect vision, what is it, 20? Hmm? 2020. But we are in 2024. <laughs> if I bring any human being who has a perfect vision, 2020, and they see little tiny writings from a very far distance, with this perfect vision, I bring them and I put them in a totally dark room. Their vision will be zero 
out of zero. All that perfect vision becomes absolutely blindness when I put them in that dark room. Why? Because the eye needs the light in order to see. And without the light, no matter what kind of a vision you have, without the light, we are totally blind. We see nothing. The Lord's eyes, from them, flame of fire comes. What is the flame? Light, meaning that He is the light itself. From Him comes the light. Internally, the light comes from Him, not externally, because He is the creator of light. He is the one who lives in the light, and He is the one who gives that light. I am the light of the world. He who walks with me shall never walk in darkness. Meaning, his eyes see the unseeable. His eyes penetrate places where it is beyond any other eye to see. In other words, everything is vividly clear in the eyes of the Lord Jesus. Nothing is hidden from him. You can run but you cannot hide from the eyes of the Lord. So you may go into that dark little alley at midnight where it's extremely dark and you can do whatever in that dark alley saying to yourself, nobody sees me. Sorry, the Lord sees you. You can't hide. You can do all the plots behind closed doors you can do all the plannings behind closed doors, underground bunkers, <laughs> secret societies. Sorry, the Lord's eyes see everything visible and invisible. Nothing is obscure to the Lord. Everything is within His vision. Because His eyes were like a flame of fire. Wow. There's so much to be said in these verses. I don't have the time. His eyes were like a flame of fire. You know, um, in verse 11 when we said, and in in righteousness he judges and makes war. Want to elaborate a little bit on this, why his eyes are like flame of fire. In righteousness he judges and makes war. Who does the Lord judge here? This is the second coming. He will judge those who went after Satan and followed Satan. He will judge the people who followed Satan. And he will make war against Satan himself. So the judgment is for the people who worship Satan. And the war will be made against Satan himself. How will the Lord judge the people that followed Satan with his word? And how is he going to make war with Satan? With the eyes like the flame of fire. So with his eyes he will wipe Satan. And with his word, he will judge the followers of Satan. One day, this person was demented. He was brought to this priest. The priest took an icon of the Lord Jesus and put it in front of that demented person. The demon inside started yelling and shouting, saying, take these eyes away from me. They are burning me. His eyes like a flame of fire. The Lord, just by looking at Satan, one tiny little look, he will decimate Satan. He will burn him forever. His eyes are like a flame of fire. He will make war against Satan with his eyes. But he will judge the followers of Satan with his word. And will come to that. That word is the sword. Judgment. And on his head 
were many crowns. On his head were many crowns. In Revelation 13, we saw that beast that came out of the sea that had seven heads and ten horns. And on those ten horns were ten crowns. That beast is Satan. Is Satan. So does Satan have crowns? What are crowns? Victories. Revelation 2.10 And if you remain faithful till the end, I shall give you the crown of life. If you remain faithful till the end, I shall give you the crown of life. So crowns here means victories. Satan in Revelation 13 had 10 horns and 10 crowns on those 10 horns, meaning victories. Does Satan get victorious at times? Yes. Every time he makes us fall and do something wrong, he's victorious. Every time he takes us away from the Lord Jesus, he's got a crown. He's victorious, but his crowns are limited. But the crowns of uh, this Lamb of God are so many, you cannot even count how many they are. Because the Lord's victories are both in the Old and the New Testament. He was victorious when he saved all the people that of the Old Testament from Adam and Enoch and Noah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the prophets and all the fathers of the Old Testament and in the New Testament he was victorious with his 12 apostles and the 70 and the church fathers for 2,000 year long history he has been taking crown after crown after crown for being victorious through his children throughout all these many and long centuries so the crowns of the Lord Jesus are many you cannot count how many they are because he's always victorious in his children. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. See, the Lord Jesus, on his second coming, humanity would have denied him. And those who walk, walked away from the Lord and denied the Lord, His name will be unknown to them. His name will be unknown to them. But here in this verse, it doesn't say what that name is. But we can gather that this name will be the conqueror. The one who will conquer every nation, every tongue, and every knee will, be, will kneel before Him. Only he knew this name. Christ on the second coming will be the conqueror forever. In the first coming, he conquered over those who accepted him as Lord and Savior. Not the whole world accepted him. Only those who accepted him, he conquered over them. But in the second coming, those who accept him or not, he will conquer over every single human being. So maybe this name that is only known to him, it may be the conqueror in his second coming. Why are you so quiet? Are you with me? That's good. Verse 13. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Now, this blood is not his blood. This blood is the blood of those who have rejected him. This is the second coming. He is coming to judge. So this blood is the blood of those who have rejected him. And then also, the blood that he shed on Calvary will be that witness to everyone who has rejected the Lord Jesus. He, is, he will say to them, the blood I shed on Calvary was to purchase you from eternal death and eternal condemnation. But you rejected this precious blood which I shed for you on the cross. This time I'm coming to crush you forever. In the second coming, the Lord will not be Mr. Nice Guy. The first coming, he is the lamb. 
The second coming, he is the roaring lion. He will come to judge. And the judgment of the Lord Jesus, no one can come out of it in one piece. If I stand before the Lord and say the Lord is judging me, I cannot say I am innocent. Because the Lord will reveal my entire life from day one till the last day. And he will show me every single place where I have denied him. No one can get away from the judgment of the Lord Jesus. So when the Lord comes to judge, his, his rope will be dipped in blood. Because blood means they will all die when God judges. Because nobody comes out innocent from the court room of the of the Lord Jesus everyone will be found guilty because everyone broke God's word and everyone is a sinner this is why the Lord came in his first coming to give us the chance not to end up in his judgment on his second coming for as long as we live in the flesh in the flesh we still have the chance and the time to come back and repent the moment we repent from our wrongdoings, we are saved. The Lord will wash us clean with His own blood. If we do not receive the blood of the Lamb of God now, we will receive our own blood upon ourselves in the second coming. So which one do you wish to receive? The blood of the Lamb for your salvation or your blood for your destruction? It's entirely up to us. Entirely up to us, my beloved. Entirely up to us. So his robe will be dipped in blood. That is the judgment of those who have rejected him. And his name is called the Word of God. The Word of God, John 1.1. 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he's called the word of God, meaning his word will judge. And the Lord Jesus said it. He said, I will not judge you. The word I spoke to you will judge you in the end. My word will judge you. I spoke. If you believe in my word and receive my word, you'll be saved. But if you reject my word, my word will come back and judge you. I am fair, I'm not harsh, I'm not coming to kill, but my word naturally does this. My word in its core is salvation, but at the same time my word is law. So if you break the law, the law will judge you, but if you abide by the law, the law will save you, true or not? If I'm driving in a 60 zone and I'm doing 59, I cannot be judged. But if I'm doing 80 or 90 or 100 in a 60 zone, that same law that saved me from being booked and fined delivered me. I was safe and sound. And I saw the copper on the side of the road with his radar pointing at my car. And I said, hello, ha. Brother, I'm doing 59 in a 60 zone. Da, na, 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 na. You cannot book me. But if I'm doing, if I'm speeding, I'm in deep trouble. The word, that is the natural thing the word does. You abide by the word, you're saved. You disrespect and go against the word, you're judged. And that's why he's called the word of God. Because the word will judge those who will reject the word. Verse 14, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. The armies in heaven are the saints. All the saints will come also dressed up in linen, white and clean. Why they are white and clean? Because the blood of the Lamb of God made them whiter than snow whiter than snow we read early in the book of revelation john the beloved saw these people coming from the great tribulation they were martyred through, during the great tribulation he said who are these 
dressed up in white. The angel said to John the beloved, these are the ones who have been dipped in the blood of the Lamb of God and being made white. They were dipped in red blood, came out whiter than snow because the blood of the Lamb of God cleanses you and makes you whiter than snow. My beloved, all those who are dressed up in linen and on white horses are the saints. They are white and clean because they accepted the sacrificial Lamb of God as their Lord and Savior. His blood made them whiter than snow and perfect clean without a blemish, without a stain because of the Lamb of God shedding His blood on Calvary. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. Verse 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. This is to everyone who thinks that the Lord Jesus came with the sword as well. And they attack Christianity, they attack the Lord Jesus and they say, even your Jesus came with a sword. Because the Lord Jesus in the gospel said, I came with the sword. I came to divide the family on itself. Father against son, mother against daughter, and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. You see, even your Jesus came with the sword. Well, in verse 15, that is the answer to you, my dear friend. What kind of a sword? the Lord is talking about this sword doesn't chop heads this sword saves souls and keeps the head intact on that body why because verse 15 says what kind of a sword the Lord came with now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword well if the Lord came with a sword that chops head that sword should be on the side here, not in the mouth. Yes? So out of his mouth came a sharp sword. What is out of his mouth that came a sharp sword? For he is called the Word of God. The Word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. It is his word, my dear friend. It is his word that is likened unto a sword. What does the sword do? Two things. Just like the word does two things. The sword can set someone free. The sword can kill someone. If we are in a battle and my friend soldier is held captive by the enemy, with the sword I went and cut the ropes and I set him free. And the same sword killed the enemy. The sword frees who is with me and the sword kills who is against me. This is the word of the Lord, which is like a sword, come, a sharp sword coming out of the mouth. The Lord says, my word, when I say it, when it is uttered out of my mouth, it is like that sharp sword. When you accept my word, the sword will set you free from the bondage of Satan. You have been held captive by the enemy, Satan. He chained you up in so many sins, my word came to set you free and clean you right out. I set you free from the bonds of Satan. But if you reject my word, the sword will come back and judge you, i.e. kill you in the end. It's up to you. It's not my fault. I came to save you. I came to deliver you. It's up to you if you accept me or not. It's entirely up to you. So now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations because the nations would have rejected him on his second coming. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He will rule them with a rod of iron. We see this in Psalm number two. You will strike them and shatter them like that terracotta jars with a rod of iron. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. What is the rod of iron? 
The word ayin in Aramaic, Syriac, those who speak the Lord's language, those who speak the Lord's language, ayin in Aramaic, Syriac is called parzla. Parzla. Now, in the Aramaic language, we only have the alphabets, we don't have numbers. So the alphabets are the alphabets and the numbers at the same time. So Alep, which is A equivalent in English, Alep is the letter and also is the number one. So the letters are letters and are also numbers. So when I want to write number one in Aramaic, I write A, Alep. We don't have numbers. The language does not have numbers. So the alphabet are the numbers. When you come to the word Perzla, which is iron, and convert the letters into numbers, the word Perzla adds up to 318 in numbers. 318. What is 318? The church fathers who got together in the Nicene Creed and wrote the Nicene creed we believe in one god almighty creator of everything that is visible and invisible we recite this in every liturgical service 318 church fathers wrote and agreed on this nicene creed there was around 2600 church fathers from all over the world gathered in in that nicaea in Nicaea, but only 318 out of the 2,400 or 2,600 church fathers, only 318 agreed on what we have readily available at our, with our, at our hands, the Nicene Creed. Only 318. This Nicene Creed is the iron rod that will rule everyone. If you do not believe in this Nicene Creed, then you will be striked down by the sword that comes out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus, His Word. If all Christians come back to the Nicene Creed, we're united. If all Christians come back to the Nicene Creed and forget about everything else, we're all united. Jesus Christ he was incarnate and born of the Virgin Mary. The Nicene Creed says, Virgin, you come and say she is not, you're in deep trouble. Anybody home? This is the iron rod that will rule over you when the Lord comes back again. If you do not believe that He is true God from true God, Jesus Christ, if you do not believe that he's true God from true God, you're in deep trouble. If you do not believe that he was crucified in the days of Pontius Pilate and was buried and rose from the dead on the third day as it is written, you're in deep trouble. If you do not believe that he ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of his father and he will come back again to judge the dead and the living, you are in deep trouble. So the Nicene Creed is that iron rod that will rule over everyone who has rejected the truth. So if all Christians, Catholic, Orthodox, everyone, go back to the Nicene Creed, we don't have a problem. We're all united. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. In the book of Isaiah, the Lord says through Isaiah the prophet, I have walked through the winepress my, by myself alone. He went through the winepress. You know, before they used to crush those grapes by foot. There was a, a little pond. They would put all those clusters and there and then step on them and crush them and it has vents and then the the juice comes out and then they make wine out of it or 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 grape juice out of it he said and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty god 
it is he himself will come to judge those who have rejected him. Even our beloved Muslims say that Isa, Isos, Jesus will come to judge the dead and the living. If Jesus is a prophet and he will judge everyone, isn't God the judge? My beloved friend, don't you believe that God is the judge? Now, if God is the judge and this is a prophet and he will judge, then where is God? Where is God? I just wonder, where is God? And last verse, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Wow. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My question to all of us, how do you know this person is a king when they dress up in a kingly outfit, correct? Now, let's say when you look at a, at a man and he's dressed up and thus that outfit tells you that this is the king, it's the royal outfit. Imagine we bring this king and we strip him of all his clothing. And we leave him naked. Would people know this is a king? They won't. The only time you recognize a king by the outfit he puts on, correct? But look at the Lord here. He says, and on, and he has on his robe and on his thigh. When will you see the man's thigh? When you strip him of his clothing, true or not? So on his robe and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What this verse is trying to say, that Jesus Christ is always king when they took him on the cross fully naked. And he is king when he is fully dressed up in his kingly outfit. He was king on the cross and he is king in his second coming, in his first coming, from the very beginning till the end and forevermore. He is the king. Whether dressed up or naked, he is the king of all kings and the Lord of all Lords. When they crucified him, he was reigning and ruling. Before the crucifixion, he said it. He said, if it wasn't my father who gave me this, you wouldn't have been able to capture me. It is I who put it and it is I who take it away. I am willingly going into the tomb, but I am coming out of the tomb also by myself. Why? Because I'm the king. I rule. You thought you got rid of me. You thought you stripped me naked. You thought you kicked me, punched me, and slapped me, and whipped me, and nailed me on the cross. All of that time, I am the King of Kings and Lord of Lords because I came to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's why I allowed you to do it. I am the one who rule. Even when you nailed me on the cross, I was ruling over you. In my utmost weakness, I am the king. And utmost mightiness, I am still the same king. Nothing can change that. I'll always be the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. On his robe and on his thigh was written, King of kings and Lord of lords. On the cross, Good Friday, he, was the, he is the king. And on Sunday resurrection, he is the king. In his first coming, he is the king. And in his second coming, he is the king. He'll always be the king. You know why? Because the king is born the king. That's why in a country where there is a king, there is no voting. You don't vote a king in and you don't vote the king out. You only vote when there is a president or a prime minister in that country. That's why we have votings in Australia, in America, in Canada, and wherever there is a president or a prime minister, there is voting, even though they falsify the outcomes, but doesn't matter, there's voting. 
But when there is a king, you don't vote because the king is the king, whether you like him or not, accept him or not, that never changes. Because whatever you are born with, no one can take it away from you. Jesus Christ is born from his father from the very beginning as the king. So he will always be the king. Whether you drag him in the street or he sits on the throne, he is ruling. He is ruling, my beloved. There are some people nowadays in the end of times, they think they are ruling the world. That's just a wishful thinking. Believe me. They have the money. They have the, the wealth. They have the power. They have bought people in high places and influential places. They bought them with money and placed them there to do and fulfill their evil agendas. In this, they think they can do whatever they wish and get away with it. It is a wishful thinking. This has never happened, never will happen, because at the end of the day, there is only one king and one ruler and one judge over everyone and everything, and his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, period. No one rules except him. No one, my beloved. So they can do whatever they want. They won't go very far. The grave is awaiting them. And when they go into that grave, judgment is fulfilled upon them. Judgment, my beloved. When you see the Lord Jesus in the next life, you will then and then only understand no one can overcome this man. And I'm talking about the man not the divine the divine forget it he can't <laughs> forget about that i'm talking about this man no one can overcome him he is that awesome he is that perfect he is that mighty as the man son of man no one can overcome this man let alone his divinity impossible impossible so whatever you're going through now whatever issues you have whatever problems you have, whatever obstacles you're encountering, whatever challenges you are facing, remember, Jesus Christ is way, way greater beyond and above all the challenges put together. Why are you worried? The doctor said you have three weeks to live. Who cares? The doctor said you have three weeks to live. Who cares, my beloved? So what? Whether I live on earth or move on matters not. Matters not. Why are you so afraid of leaving this world? Now, whether we wish to remain here or not, one day I'll have to leave whether I like it or not. And wouldn't you want to be with the love of your life sooner than later? Wouldn't you want to be with the Lord Jesus forever? Enjoy his holy presence and be filled with joy and happiness forever. There, there will be no more tears. There will be no more aging. There will be no more aching. There will be no more pain, sorrow, no more weakness, no more. Everything will become anew. So what? I live or die. As long as I live and I die for the Lord. Doesn't matter. Believe me, it doesn't matter. One day I'll have to go. I'm not here forever. Only the Lord is. So we need to seek the Lord Jesus. We need to beg Him to have mercy on us. To bring us back to Him. To show us the way, for He is the way. Live for the Lord. And enjoy the moment with the Lord. 
The people the Lord has given you, love them. The people the Lord has brought them your way, embrace them. The people the Lord has put you in the midst of them, pray for them and look after them. It doesn't matter they give you a hard time or not. It doesn't matter they are nice to you and sometimes not so nice to you. It matters not. The Lord gave you these people. Maybe to you this person is not smart enough, is not beautiful enough. Who cares? Do you think you're smart or beautiful? You're not. All of us are the same. Every single one of us have, have, we have in us good things and bad things, beautiful things and not so beautiful things. But what matters is one thing. Focus on the Lord and embrace everything the Lord gives you. Even the partner you're with who is a pain in the neck. Thank God for that partner. And when I say partner, I mean your husband or your wife, okay? No boyfriend, girlfriend. I will kill you. I have red belt in karate. I chop you. Today I was listening to one of the lectures this good old bishop was, <laughs> was preaching. I laughed at the way the bishop was talking, <laughs> like me. <laughs> because I said something and I cracked up laughing today. I said, man, this guy's funny and he's, he's, he's kind of <laughs> crazy as well. That was funny. Yeah. I was actually talking about uh, doing a facelift in Istanbul. And I said, this woman changed from Khadija to Mariah Carey. I just laughed at this one. <laughs> How did I come up with this? I have no idea. <laughs> like on the spot, poor Khadija to Mariah Carey. What a great, you know, illustration. Unbelievable. So I really laughed at the bishop, the way he spoke it was very funny. So you see, you can laugh at yourself as well sometimes when you listen to yourself. The Lord Jesus is the only reason for our existence. The only reason. Love the Lord, my beloved. Love the Lord. I'll leave you with this definitely. Right? I want to keep you more, but you know. Just... One day, I was dying to become a priest. I'm a bishop at the moment. Apparently very well known in the world, but not accepted by some churches. But it doesn't matter. It's all good. So I was dying to become a priest. All my hope, all my wish, every thought was circulating around this I want to be a priest. The day came, they announced it that I will be ordained a priest. Now I'm saying it for you. I'm not talking about anyone. Please don't take it out of context. I am saying it for you from and learn from this living example before your own eyes. I benefit nothing from it. But I want you to know one thing, how the Lord deals with every single one of us. He taught me this, and I'd like to share it with you after the Lord's permission. Will you, Lord, allow me? I was dying to become a priest. It was announced I'll be a priest. Flying from joy and happiness. I wouldn't even sleep. I don't care. I'm becoming a priest. There was two days left for my ordination. I got deposed from the church by the highest rank in that church. Two days left to the ordination. I got deposed. For one week, literal one week, I ate nothing. I drank nothing. I did not move from my room or from the room. It's not my room. It's the Lord's. Everything is the Lord's. I don't own nothing. 
I am owned by the Lord. And everything I have is the Lord's. One week, like a statue, from the biggest shock I received in my entire life until that moment. Every dream, every hope just trembled down right before my own eyes. As if I was killed, but I'm not dead yet. I became speechless, emotionless, you name it. Destroyed, destroyed big times. After one week, my God rest her soul, my earthly mother. Mothers are wonderful, you know. My sons and daughters, respect your mom and dad. Respect your mom and dad. They are not perfect. Sometimes they will do things that are wrong or say things that are wrong, but I can assure you, they are a treasure. You will never understand that treasure until you lose that treasure. You'll never understand. So my mom came and, son, come on, please come out, eat something, drink something. I was gone, finished. Years went by. To be more sort of accurate, about six years, I was ordained a priest by the same church. But at that time, I didn't want to be a priest. I fought against the Lord badly not to be a priest. I begged him, leave me alone. I don't want it. I said, Lord, I don't want it. I'm not worthy. Find someone else. I don't want it. There are, I'm sure there are many other ch children of yours that are much more worthy than me. I'm a piece of wreck. Find someone else. Two months struggled. Two months struggled begging the Lord, fighting the Lord, saying no. Couple of days before I give an answer, the Lord came. Not a dream, not a vision, real. I'm sitting during the day. He came and spoke. He said, stop fighting me. I have my hand holding your neck. I've grabbed you from the neck. Stop fighting me. You cannot win. Give up and do what I want you to do. This is from me for you. You will be a priest. This is Jesus' wish. When I heard his voice talking to me this way, I surrendered. The entire struggle came to a full halt. I became a priest after six years. He taught me a very valuable lesson, very valuable, and I'm sharing it with you. He said, you know why I allowed them to depose you from the church? It wasn't them, it was me. You need to learn how the Lord operates. You need to trust. You need to learn how to trust the Lord. He said, it wasn't them who deposed you, it was me. I allowed them to depose you. I am in control. Yes, he is the king of kings. This name is written on the rope and on his thigh. Whether naked on Good Friday or whether glorified on Sunday resurrection, I am always the king and I'm always in charge. So they can't depose you. I allowed them because I am the king of all kings. I rule no one else. The Pope cannot do anything unless I allow it. So, you know why I allowed them to depose you? Because I wanted you to learn one thing. And it took six years for you to learn. I understood. You know what it was? He said, you were not ready earlier for me to give you the rank. I already gave it. I already gave it to you, but it was not the right time for you to have it as yet. But it's guaranteed you will be a priest and no one can stop it. But if I had given you the rank at the time, you would have looked at the rank and forgotten about the one who gave you the rank. But now that I took you to the desert 
and I taught you well in that desert, now you are ready to receive the rank because when I'm going to give it, you will never look at the rank, but you will look at the one who gave you the rank. Now you're ready. And let me see, those who went against you, let me see if they're going to stand against you when I say, now you are to be ordained. I'll make them come and ask you to be one. And they did, they came. Matters not. Who cares? I'm a bishop. I'm the who cares? I'm the Pope. Who cares? Habibi, my darling, my centerling. Let me tell you this. It doesn't matter. You are the head of the church. You are the cardinal. You are the bishop. You are a rich man. You are the, this or that. It matters not. What matters is, are you with the Lord? or not are you so i thank you lord i do not look at the rank anymore even though it is holy because it comes from the holy of holies jesus christ is the high priest and he gives his priesthood rank to whom he chooses and gives to but i more so i thank the one who gave me the rank therefore lord when people come in the millions and in the billions and say, Bishop, you're this, uh, we love you, we adore you, you're wonderful. No, you can say that fine. But for me, I've learned the lesson. It is the Lord, not me. It is him who is glorious, who is beautiful, who is caring, loving, and he is merciful. It is the Lord who is reaching out to you. I don't care about the position. That's why throne, no throne, for me it's the same. Accepted in the church, rejected by the church, for me it's the same. You love me, you hate me, for me it's the same. I will love you. It doesn't matter, Habib Albi. I'll make you tabbouleh, baba ghanoush, and Italian pizza. It matters not. You love me, you don't love me, I love you. Believe me, it, nothing is worth it in this life because at the end, the grave is waiting and after the grave, judgment by the true judge, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. F find the Lord, look for the Lord, search for the Lord. Don't look for nobody else. Don't look for nobody else. It took six years. The Lord said, you were too eager to becoming a priest, dangerous, not mature enough. I'll give the rank when, you're, when you are more mature. So now, Bishop, we love you. Bishop, we hate you. I love you. You're beautiful. You're ugly. I love you. I know I'm beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. That's what matters. Who cares you call me ugly? The Lord says, he's my son. Hallelujah, baby. <laughs> Learn. Learn how to trust the Lord. Everything he does is good. Even when it is painful, it is good. When I go through the operating theater and I look at the surgeon's knife, it's a scary sight to look at. But that very knife that is going to cut me wide open is the very knife that is going to be the reason for my healing. The Lord operates. He cuts, extracts strange things in your body. But then he stitches and heals the wound. After healing, you're recovered. No more pain, no more weakness, no more crying. No more. It's all good. On the rope and on the thigh was written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh my. Man. Jesus is amazing. The Lord is amazing. And I love you.
قارت أمتي I love you. This is an Assyrian uh, comedian that says uh, this kind of words. Qarad Amti means on the grave of my auntie, I love you. It's, a, it's an Assyrian way of expressing like how much I love you, like on the grave of my auntie, I love you. Even if I don't have an auntie, I'll make one and I'll kill her and I'll bury her so I can say on the grave of my auntie, I love you. This is the typical Assyrian of expressing our love for the one we love the most. On the grave of my auntie, I love you. Love the Lord, my beloveds. Amen. Eddie, are you ready? Fan of the hymn? Yalla. Let's go.
Amen to that. What a powerful name it is. Amen. Just a couple of announcements and then we'll let you go in uh, peace of Christ and the love of Christ back home. Back home, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, The Divine Heart Sunday School are going on a small break uh, from Monday the 15th of April and they will return on Sunday the 12th of May. So um, they'll have a break, the Divine Heart Sunday School from the 15th of April, coming back on the 12th of May. Um, also from the Divine Heart Sunday School, um, this is uh, for the parents and their children. Uh, there will be a divine liturgy held here at the church, celebrated at the church, on, um, on the 20th of April at 6 p.m. On the 20th of April at 6 p.m. This is the divine uh, liturgy for the parents and their beautiful children who are enrolled in the Divine Heart Sunday School. So I believe it's a Saturday, 20th of April at 6 p.m. One thing about the sponsorship program that we've uh, been announcing the last few months, just letting you know that it's really going well, but we will always announce it every now and then, just to remind people to be part of it. Um, and if you can donate whatever amount it is, it's a dollar to whatever amount it is, it, you have no idea what kind of a, a difference it's making in people's lives and saving people's lives throughout the world. Um, we could tell you endless stories of beautiful, beautiful outcomes because of these donations that are coming to the uh, Good Samaritan Aid Society, GSAS, G-S-A-S dot org dot A-U, um, by sponsoring a child or a family. And I can tell you some of the uh, money that we send are for urgent operations. It's not just helping out children or families with hamper or some money. But we're getting uh, a lot of phone calls for urgent, urgent operations or life-saving operations. And um, you should hear the prayers and the best wishes that are sending your way from the people who are really having their life changed and being saved and coming out in good health and in good spirit once again. Thanking the Lord for all of you, praying for you, for your families, for your loved ones. Now this is priceless, my beloveds. When somebody who is genuinely desperate for help and you give a helping hand to them, when they come out of that trouble, you have no idea those prayers are definitely coming from the heart. Definitely coming from the heart. And the Lord hears the prayers that come from the heart. So you have no idea how much they pray for all of you and wish you nothing but the very best for helping them and saving them and bringing them out of their whatever difficult situation they've been in. So the program is still on and we thank God it's going really well and we pray that it will grow more and more and we can do more wonderful things at a global level. Um, again, a reminder about the One Jesus International Conference. You could register. You could visit the uh, Good Shepherd, Christ the Good, Christ the Good Shepherd Church, Facebook and Instagram. The link is there. Or you could visit the, the church website as well, uh, the homepage, cgsc.org.au forward slash OJIC, One Jesus International Conference. Or you can speak to one of the youth group committee members. There is a QR code out here in the foyer. You can just put, tap your phone on it and it'll take you directly to the home page or to the page where you can register or get the information that you need. Um, so this is open for everyone, globally and within Australia as well. <clears throat> um, this, this is the last announcement. It's for our beautiful um, program that has been going for years called Food Angel, which is to do with food hampers being provided to families and those who are in need. Um, they have nominated us to be, um, uh, to be like uh, the uh, nominee charity in the Fairfield Local Business Award. So we've entered that uh, nomination. We need your votes. 
you know, uh, the more votes we get, uh, the, the, the more bigger chance we'll have to uh, win the award. And obviously that's going to help the program to grow more and to be known more. Uh, I can show you this program is, uh, is the one and only, not only in Fairfield, Liverpool and the surrounding LGAs, it is the only program that is going on a very big scale. So um, uh, to the Fairfield City Council, um, you should pay attention more to the Food Angel program because it's a beautiful image for the Fairfield LGA uh, and also uh, to the community as a whole, uh, for Sydney people uh, as a whole. It's a wonderful, wonderful program reaching out to so many people. During lockdowns, we gave about 3,000 hampers for free. 3,000 hampers for free during lockdowns. We, we used to have cars lined up for kilometers long from 8 a.m. till 2, 3 p.m., sometimes 4 p.m. We're here handing hampers during lockdowns and I didn't put the mask on. I oh, just had to throw that in. But the program is helping a lot of families that are struggling here in Sydney and we can see it. There's a big financial struggle happening now because of everything has skyrocketed in prices. Rent, mortgages, petrol, food, groceries, whatever. Everything is expensive now. There is a lot of people that truly struggle. We are reaching out to those families. Not only it's open to everyone, but the more you get these hampers, the more we can help and give free hampers to families that are truly, truly struggling. We get phone calls all the time. It breaks your heart. You would never think that happens in Sydney. But we get phone calls. Sometimes, like we, we do that once a fortnight on a Saturday. We give hampers out. But we get throughout the week, um, there is this family have no food. They have no food for the last two days. Mother, children, starving in Sydney. We put a big hamper together straight away on the spot. We drive it personally to their doorstep. And also the money that comes, and it's very minute. It's not about money, it's about humanitarian work. This is the way we show love for one another. Helping the bigger community. So it's been nominated to enter this nominee for um, Fairfield Local Business Award. So please uh, visit the, um, the page and uh, put your vote. There's a QR code as well in there. Um, <clears throat> And you can, uh, you can go to that, to that link that you see on the screen. Go to that link and just vote for us, please. We want to win this award. And we say, Aussie, 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 aye, aye, aye. Right? So it's wonderful. Yes, this is uh, a program under the Good Samaritan Aid Society. But at the same time, people come to the church here. We give hampers from the church. They come to the church. They realize we're Christians. Right? So that's what matters the most. It's a program for everyone. Christians, non-Christians. This is for the community of our beloved, beautiful city of Sydney. But at the same time, they realize we are Christians. And it's another way of saying to the world, this is what the Lord is all about. The church is to give, not just to take. The church is to give, not just to take. Donate, donate, donate. No, we want to give you as well. The Lord is very rich and his richness never ends. And we need to reach out to people that are in need and struggle. This is the richness of the church when the church helps the needy. This is our treasure. This is our wealth. This is our property and possession when we help the needy. Every time I go down to the city for feeding the homeless, not the homeless, the brothers in Christ. Every time I go there, I am revived. I feel so alive again, so fresh, amazing. You meet so many people that live literally at the gutter, li sleep on a concrete path, footpath. But when they come and talk to you and engage in a conversation with you, blows your mind away. Amazing, amazing, amazing. We need to think of people that are truly struggling. Please vote for this Food Angel program. 
and the more votes we have, share this um, link with everyone you know on social media platform. Say vote for the Food Angel program and we want to get this award and say yes. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us beautiful people that are serving the Lord and, pro and showing a beautiful image, uh, being a Christian to their greater community there and saying, this is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He loves everyone, never differentiate. Amen. All right, God bless you. Let us stand for the finale prayer now. And may the Lord Jesus be with you always, my beloved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you and protect you all the days of your life, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. The peace of Christ be with you always, my beloved. See you next time. God bless. Lord, I'm standing here before you. Knowing you are in control Resting in your heavenly glory Let your will be done for me I cast my burdens on to you Trusting in your blood you shed for me I know you've copied all my sins I'm standing here in victory And knowing you have done it all Your desire in all the glory Let us praise your holy name God, you never let me go. Through my darkest days, you're with me. Yeah, you have always been my strength. I cast my burdens on to you, Lord, and knowing you. Trusting in your blood you shed for me I know you've covered all my sins I'm standing here in victory Knowing you have done it all Your desire in all the glory Let us praise your holy name
worshiping your holy Thank you.